Okay, hello, and welcome back uh, to our continuing discussion of the tuner. This has gone on a little long, but there's two reasons for that. One, I mean, we're learning a lot of stuff about capacitors and inductors that is just generally useful in electricity, and so isn't necessarily going to, every last bit of it anyway, make it so that we can understand our tuner. But they're important devices, and so we need a little bit of background there. Um, but the other bit of good news there is that once we understand the tuner in this radio receiver, and just understanding the rest of it, so the other components off to the right in that diagram, if you remember it from the previous videos, well, that's not going to take very much time. Probably a eh, video or two, depending if I make them long or short, after this one. Okay, so here we have a simple circuit. We're getting closer to something that looks like our tuner, though, right? We've got our... Uh, let me grab my pen and let me make it some other color other than red. Okay, green's good. So what we've got here is our inductor, right, and our capacitor in parallel with one another and a power source, okay? Now to start out, what all we're doing here is we're going to charge up the capacitor. You could do this with the inductor. Charging up an inductor is basically... Uh, you, you um, let's see. You chop the get rid of the capacitor. You close this switch. You turn. You connect the battery. So you close this uh, switch on the left. You flow current through the inductor. Remember, the inductor will oppose that current initially, but eventually it'll because the current is no longer changing and you're applying a you know constant voltage from the battery. Uh, it would uh, just allow current to flow right through it. And if you have a lot of current flowing through the inductor, then you have a big magnetic field around the inductor, and that's where it stores its electrical energy. Either way you want to do it, I'm going to energize uh, the capacitor because that's a little easier to, to, to draw. So right now we've just got one complete circuit, right? Charge flows here and then completes to the negative, and we're accumulating positive charges on the top, and we are driving positive charges away from the bottom. I mean, we know that it's electrons doing this, so it's kind of the reverse of that, but basic idea, build up positive charge here, drive positive charge away from here, that causes current to flow until the voltage difference across the capacitor cancels the voltage difference from the source, and then no current, and the capacitor would be fully charged. Okay, so that's what we're doing in this first step, step one. Okay? Now, what we're going to do is we're going to remove the battery from the circuit, and we're going to close this switch so that the only thing in this circuit is a bunch of conducting wires, which we're going to take to have actually zero resistance, though in real life would have uh, a tiny amount of resistance. And uh, we're going to see what happens. Okay? So when we do that, so here we've, we've opened this switch, battery we, may, we can basically ignore, and we know that now we only have one completed circuit now that we've closed the switch. And that means that current is going to flow from the capacitor okay, through the inductor and back around. Okay? And remember, we talked about this in the last video. The capacitor has some energy stored dependent on uh, how much charge it's got on its plates and the voltage across it. And as the charge flows away, then the voltage across the capacitor decreases because that, volt, that, that those charges are the source of that voltage difference. Okay, well, remember what an inductor does when you try to change the current going through it. In this situation, before the switch was, clo was closed, well, there's no current going through the inductor, and now suddenly you're trying to push current through this direction, which means that the countering voltage, which I've already di diagrammed here, is going to work against the voltage that the capacitor is applying. And so the, the rise of current is not instantaneous, and there's a time <clears throat> that passes as the inductor is uh, resisting against the current flow that the capacitor is trying to push. However, right, eventually the voltage, eventually some current will flow and the voltage on the capacitor actually starts to drop. So what happens then? Well, in that case, what we've got, so again, uh, battery we can ignore. This is still closed. But 
as the capacitor's charge weakens, so like imagine, you know, it goes from all the way charge to like halfway charge and it's still dropping because it's still trying to push current this way. Well, now the inductor's counter voltage is going to flip because in this situation, so in, uh, in step two, okay, we were going from a situation where there was zero current through the inductor to a situation where we were trying to drive current through it this direction. So its voltage difference opposes that change from zero to something. But then, of course, uh, once the current gets going and then the capacitor is running out of juice, running out of charge, okay, let's use a technical term, uh, and this current in this direction starts to get smaller and smaller, okay? Well, now the current in this direction is dropping, right? And the inductor, again, is going to oppose the change. And so it's countering voltage, well, it's oppo opposing the change kind of voltage, I suppose I should say, is going to flip. You notice that now the negative is on the top, the positive is on the bottom, and it tries to prop up this current. So let's think about what happens next. Okay, so the inductor flips its countering voltage so that it tries to prop up the current that's trying to, starting to drop off because the capacitor is running out of charge and eventually it runs completely out of charge. But what this means is that now that the energy source in the circuit has effectively become the magnetic field of the inductor and it's trying to continue current flowing in this direction, well, what is that going to do to the capacitor? Right now that it's out of charge, well, now we're going to be putting little positive charges onto this plate of the capacitor, right? The reverse of what we had in the first place when we charged up the capacitor for the battery and so on and so forth. And then that means that there's going to be negative charges up here on the top of the capacitor. And this current will continue to flow until the magnetic field of the inductor has weakened all the way down to basically nothing and it's driven all of the charge it can onto the capacitor. But now we've returned to a situation where the circuit has basically no current going through it. There's not much current going through. There's no current or very little or no current going through the inductor. And if we look at that and we compare it to what we had up here just before we um, close this circuit, we have a very similar situation except that uh, the polarity of the volt of the capacitor has flipped, right? It's positive on the top and negative here. So it starts out positive on top and negative in the middle here in step two. And then here, right, at the end of step three, it has uh, charged up again, but with the opposite polarity, okay? So what's gonna happen next? Hmm. Well, give me a chance to think about that while I get out my eraser. What's going to happen next? Well, if it's just like sort of how step two started, right? Fully charged capacitor, albeit the opposite polarity. Well, then it's going to... I've raised too much. Oh, no. Okay. It's going to uh, have a polarity that is opposing. So it's this. Okay. And so what it's going to do once this charge, that once this charge flow has dropped off and the L doesn't have any energy left stored in its magnetic field, so there's not much voltage across it, et cetera, et cetera. It's gonna start driving current back the other way. Now, as far as what the subsequent steps look like, well, it's gonna look exactly like this sequence, except in reverse, because the current flows here, it's rising and so this thing is going to have a voltage that tends to oppose that so current will flow for a little while here the capacitor will start to weaken then this thing's voltage uh, difference will reverse as it tries to prop up the dwindling current from the capacitor and then it's going to this eventually will run out of charge and then this thing will be the source of power and will be driving current this way and then you'll start getting positive charge building up here and negative charge building back, building back here and you'll be all the way back to the beginning of the cycle that we saw here okay the basic idea being that once you charge up the capacitor cut the battery out of here close the, this switch to put just the L and the C, the inductor and the capacitor in a circuit by themselves, 
you get this oscillation in current that goes on theoretically forever. Okay, the oscillation will continue with no if there's no resistance forever at the circuit's, circuit's resonant frequency. Okay, and I mentioned sort of offhandedly that the time that it takes for the capacitor to discharge and for the magnetic field of the inductor to build up and then for that whole process to reverse and back and forth and back and forth was dependent on the components in this thing. And what it's dependent on is how much inductance there is, so how good an inductor it is, so can it store lots of energy or only a little energy, and also how much capacitance there are, so how much energy can it store in that separation of charge on its plates. And those two things, along with some constants, dictate this resonant frequency that this will oscillate back and forth at. So if you if you actually put on like an oscilloscope and you measured voltage versus time of, you know, say the capacitor or the inductor, it doesn't really matter, they'd be, they'd be out of phase with each other, but same kind of uh, oscillation, you'd have some oscillation because of this reversing current back and forth and back and forth as the uh, energy went back and forth between the separation of charge in the capacitor and the magnetic field uh, as a result of the current going through the inductor. And the frequency of this oscillation is that resonant frequency. Okay. So how does this relate to our tuner? Well, our tuner is also a little parallel combination of C and L. And so that suggests that it too has a resonant frequency. But that situation is different than this one, right? We are essentially putting in some energy from the battery, then removing the battery here, opening that switch, and then allowing this thing to oscillate. You can make an, an analogy between this and like a tuning fork. You, the, the battery charging up the capacitor is the equivalent of hitting the tuning fork on something, and then the tuning fork will ring at a particular frequency of sound for a long time, okay? And this circuit rings, quote unquote, by having this oscillation in current and thus voltage on the capacitor and inductor. Okay. So in the case of the tuner in, the, um, in our radio circuit, well, we're not just hitting it once or attaching a battery once and charging it up. The power source in that, in that in that radio receiver is the electromagnetic wave that's causing an oscillation of charge in the antenna. So we're taking this and kind of attaching it to uh, kind of an AC source, not really because it's receiving all sorts of different electromagnetic waves at different frequencies and things like that, but the, the, the idea is similar in that we're inputting a bunch of different frequencies of AC signals to this L and C combination. And going back to the tuning fork, you'll know with the tuning fork is that for that particular tuning fork, when you hit it and you let it ring, it only ever rings at that one frequency. All of the other frequencies that might uh, you might be able to hear like a tiny bit of when you first hit it, so sort of off-key stuff or off-tone stuff, well, those all damp out. They go away very, very quickly. And the analogy to the tuner in our radio receiver is that when you put in frequencies at, well, put in AC signals because of those electromagnetic waves, like maybe one at one carrier frequency and one at like another carrier frequency and one at a really high frequency, okay, lots of different frequencies coming in on the antenna and causing oscillations in charge. But in terms of what actually <clears throat> How this, how this uh, tuner responds to each one of those frequencies, well, only the signal whose frequency matches the resonant frequency of this LC combination is gonna be sent to the remaining part of the receiver circuit and show up on the speaker, okay? In electrical terms, uh, what I can tell you and how that makes sense is that the voltage difference across the LC combination, so from, from here down to ground, okay, is greatest at its resonant frequency, okay? Now, what does that mean? Okay, well, that, that means that if there's a big voltage difference, then its apparent resistance is at a maximum, okay? So when you have a particular frequency, say it's, uh, 
say it's this one on the right. Okay, so say it's this one. Okay. That carrier wave equals the resonant frequency of this thing. Okay. Well, then that signal is the one that comes down here, sees a big resistance between he right here between it and ground. So instead of just going shooting right through and going to ground, it sees a big resistance. And so most of the power okay, associated with that signal that matches the resonant frequency of this LC goes off in this direction and gets detected and filtered and put out on the speaker. The rest of these frequencies though, I'll put a couple of X's by them, okay? Because they don't equal the resonant frequency of the LC combination, well, they see much lower resistances as a result, okay? and that means that a significant amount of the power associated with those signals sees this, as, sees this LC combination as a low resistance. And so instead of going off and going through diodes and filters and speakers and things like that, it just says, sweet, I can complete, I can com complete to ground, and off I go. And so none of the power of those off resonant frequencies ever shows up in the, the latter portion of the circuit that's going to output the sound that we want to hear, okay? Um, now these curves come up in other contexts, but if you wanted to represent what this is in terms of a graph, you can sort of look at like this, and then there's sort of a peak here and coming down on that side. And this peak is, and if you, you put the peak, this is, uh, just call it R, though technically it's a quantity called Z, the impedance, okay, because there's inductance and capacitance involved, but apparent resistance of this combination. And the center of that peak is at F0, and this, this axis is frequency. So if you are offset from the resonant frequency by any significant amount, so if like the you have a carry wave coming into your antenna and you're tuned for this resonant frequency, and you have a carry wave that comes in at this frequency, well then the resistance, the apparent resistance that it sees from the L and C combination is quite low, and so most of its power skips going through any other parts of the receiver and goes directly to ground, okay? That's the idea. So all of those other receiver frequencies are greatly attenuated, and the degree of this attenuation is called selectivity. This, this radio receiver, because it's not particularly sophisticated, I've pared it down to the minimum possible number of components, uh, does not have great selectivity. You probably end up tuning into sort of one radio station really quite well, and then you might be able to catch a hint of uh, ones that are adjacent to it on the frequency band, but eh, probably not. Okay. Still pretty selective. Okay. So that's the idea behind the tuner. The tuner essentially presents a higher or lower apparent resistance based on the properties of L and C and how they combined, uh, dependent on the frequency of the signal that it's receiving. So because it's receiving lots of different frequencies, it is selects just the one that corresponds to the resonant frequency of the LC combination, which as you can see is only dependent on the inductance and capacitance of those two things. The way that we actually tune in a radio <clears throat> is by having either the L or the C be adjustable. And that's what this arrow through the C means on the diagram, meaning that you can adjust the capacitance of the capacitor by fiddling with the spacing between the plates or something like that and thus change the resonant frequency and thus change which of the signals coming into the antenna you actually are picking up and sending off to the speaker, okay? So next time we'll talk about the last stages of translating an electromagnetic wave from a radio transmitter into a sound that we can actually hear. And the nice thing is, is that after we understand this tuner, like I said at the beginning of the video, we are pretty home free. We might actually be able to do um, the next one in either one long video or two shorter ones. I might go with the two shorter ones option. So we'll see you then, and thanks for listening.